Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here. And let's start with a very happy Father's Day to everybody. So let's have all the dads, grandparents, granddads, uh, anybody who's filled that fatherly role, stand up so we can acknowledge you. All right. Thank you for joining us here on Father's Day, a day that we're going to open up our scriptures and look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul is trying to maybe sort of answer that question for us. What does the Christian life look like? What is it like to, to walk in faith, as he puts it? Walk by faith and not by sight. So what does that look like in our, our daily, day-to-day -day lives? And we'll, we'll kind of explore how different churches have uh, embodied that message over the years and maybe maybe where we've all gone a, a little bit wrong and, and what we should be focusing on here uh, during this Christian life. So blessings on your worship today. Uh, let's see, announcements, um, men's lunches, this Thursday at Manja Manja, uh, Thursday, June 20th at noon. And I have also been given a special announcement to make the August Men's Luncheon uh, is going to be rescheduled for Saturday, August 10th. And you're going to want to put this on your calendar because it is going to be a special Men's Luncheon. I have been sworn to secrecy. I can't tell you anything more about it. It is all hush hush secret, but it's going to be a fun one. So keep that date open, uh, Saturday, May, t or August 10th, Saturday, August 10th. 
And let's see here, Vacation Bible School is coming up July 15th to the 19th. Get those kids registered and register yourself to sign up and be an adult volunteer as well. Uh, and our blood drive, we had to reschedule our blood drive. They, they didn't have enough workers to work on the day that we had picked. So we are rescheduling the blood, dro blood drive. It is going to be on Sunday, July 7th. So upcoming blood drive on Sunday, July 7th. And you can sign up for that at valleylutheran.org slash blood. What's that? Yes, it had to be changed. It was August 4th, and then they just told us on Friday that they can't, can't staff it. So the other day they had open was July 7th. So we're gonna do it on Sunday, July 7th. And I think that's it for announcements. So blessings on your worship, and let us begin today with confession and forgiveness. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us come before our loving God with humility and repentance, acknowledging our sins and seeking his forgiveness and guidance. Gracious God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not lived in accordance with your will, and we have not consistently sought your guidance in our daily lives. Forgive us, Lord, and renew our hearts. Embrace the abundant grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he came to redeem us and to show us the way to eternal life. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at worship again. Happy Father's Day.
please continue standing as we sing our second worship song. Our scripture focus for today is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. We know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we were still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. 
He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is the word of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Various different Christian groups have attempted to define what it is to live the Christian life, often emphasizing different aspects of behavior or lifestyles as markers of that true faith. These differing emphases have led to distinct and sometimes conflicting interpretations of what is Christian living. The turn of the 20th century, the evangelist Billy Sunday was a prominent advocate for temperance. A former professional baseball player turned evangelist, Sunday became a powerful voice in the movement against alcohol. He preached that temperance was a crucial mark of a Christian, arguing that alcohol was the source of societal evil and personal ruin. Sunday's fiery sermons, they drew large crowds, and his message resonated deeply with many, highly contributing to the eventual passage of prohibition in the United States. According to Sunday, Christians should abstain from all drinking, as consuming alcohol was incompatible with living the Christian life. Obviously, Billy Sunday was not one of our Lutherans, <laughs> nor are his sermons taught at our Lutheran seminaries these days. But other groups define Christian living by focusing on modesty or simplicity, especially in appearance or behavior. Often associated with the holiness or Pentecostal movements, which emerged in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, these movements emphasize personal holiness and living a life separate from worldly influences. Women in these communities were often engaged or required to refrain from cutting their hair, wearing makeup, or donning jewelry. Unsurprisingly, the restrictions on men were far less stringent. But these external markers were seen as expressions of inner piety and commitment to God. The rationale was that maintaining a, a kind of natural appearance would prevent vanity and promote a focus on a spiritual, religious Christian life rather than material beauty. Another group of Christians, for example, rather familiar to us here in Ohio, believes that modern technology poses a threat to the simple, devout lifestyle and that embracing such technology would lead to moral or spiritual decay. This perspective, as you know, most notably seen in the Amish or old Mennonite communities. These groups, which trace their origins back to the Anabaptist movement of the 16th century, they, they strive to live lives that reflect the teachings and the simplicity of the early Christian church. To them, that's what the Christian life looks like. They reject all those forms of modern technology, booting those innovations as distractions that can lead to a dependence on material comforts rather than spiritual growth. And you know me, I'm not very likely to get on the anti-technology bandwagon, <laughs> but maybe there's something to be said for it because I will say they can build one heck of a wooden ramp. <laughs> credit where credit is due. And other groups, they define the Christian life in terms of other highly specific regulations. Seventh-day Adventists say that a Christian must worship on the Sabbath. And by Sabbath, they mean Saturday. None of that silly celebrating the resurrection on the day of the resurrection for them. Jehovah's Witnesses will knock on every door in town except for the one leading to the Red Cross blood drive next month because they hold a very broad interpretation of some Old Testament lines about the lifeblood being holy to God. Similarly, Christian scientists shun the science of medicine, seeing it as a lack of faith in God's provision. And I'd say something about what the Catholic Church teaches, what the Christian life, or maybe I should say that the Catholic life looks like, but we don't have that kind of time this morning, <laughs> so they get a pass. Unless I look to the specks in all of our brothers' eyes and not our own, we Lutherans think that we know what the Christian life looks like as well. Clearly, it is about uplifting communal worship and the academic study of God's word, and we will focus on that just as long as our cups are not empty. <laughs> Be it coffee, beer, or even water from the new water cooler that's coming to the narthex this week. Lutherans don't seem to be happy unless our cups are full and our casseroles are multi-layered. We all think we know, or at least maybe have just decided, what makes up the Christian life. And each Christian group tends to define this a little bit differently and focus on different aspects of what we find in Scripture. 
The problem is that all of these groups, they face the same thing. They, 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 they come up against this problem where we tend to create an additional set of laws beyond what is biblically prescribed. Most all Christian churches will mostly agree that Christians are saved by grace, which is a free gift from God. They will also, in theory at least, agree that the Ten Commandments cannot save us. But then in this vacuum of regulation, churches tend to come up with a new list of commands which we should live by. And understanding how this happens, it isn't hard. Certainly the Apostle Paul believes that Christians should live differently from non-Christians. We see that in our reading for today. There are places in his writings where he offers specific moral standards. In other writings, he talks about being thankful and having a positive attitude on life. Paul even briefly offers his advice on alcohol. Don't get drunk, but don't drink just plain water either. Have a little wine for your stomach. Most of the time, however, Paul goes deeper than outward actions and talks about what motivates Christians to act differently and just to be different from others. And this is what he's doing in our lesson for today. Paul's references to being at home in the body and away from the Lord may at first appear to be a little confusing. But if we view the Christian life through the lens of relationships, as Paul often does, his words begin to become clear. Paul says that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. And we know, well, we know what separation is like. Right? Every day is filled with different types of separation. The kids go off to school while mom and dad, are, they go off to work. Then there are the longer separations. Right? This past week, my daughter went off to camp, and a week feels like a long time to be without a loved one. But then think about how hard it is for couples and families that are separated for even longer periods of time because of work or school or something like that. Think of the dedication of the deployed servicemen and women who are separated from their families for long periods of time during a long deployment. We know separation is diff difficult. But the key part of these relationships is that even while separated, we still live in the reality of that relationship. Children are still children when they go off to school. Right? Parents are still parents at work. Couples are still couples, even when deployed overseas. Distance does not nullify that relationship. And Christians have a relationship with Jesus. Once he walked among us, but now we're separated from him. Even though we are separated from Jesus and we do not know when we will be re reunited with him, we live each day in the reality that we are loved, forgiven, and empowered for ministry in his name. Living in that reality is what Paul is talking about when he says walking by faith. For Paul, walking by faith does not imply blind belief or adhering to some unseen deity's whims. Instead, it means having trust and confidence in someone who we know and love. It's the same trust that a child places in their parents, knowing that they will return home after a day of work. It's the same confidence you place in your spouse, knowing that they will remain faithful even while they're miles away on a trip. This kind of faith stems from a profound relationship that shapes our lives regardless of our physical distance. The Christian relationship with Jesus is even stronger, for we trust in someone who is ultimately reliable. Walking by faith in Christ means living with that daily assurance that we are forgiven of our sins and are accepted by God, not because of our achievements or merit, but entirely out of God's love for us. It doesn't rely on our strict adherence to laws written by God or man. Don't get me wrong, we should follow God's laws at least, but his love isn't conditional on our perfection. Living the Christian life and walking in faith means always living in the hope that one day we will be reunited with Jesus. And we constantly look forward to that reunion. 
It means recognizing that as long as we're in these earthly bodies, these, these tents, as Paul describes them in our text, we are indeed separated from our Lord. But that separation, it does not nullify or diminish our relationship with him. It does, however, change us. All relationships change us. Right? That, that first love we have, it teaches us to love someone deeply. And marriage teaches us commitment and, and nurturing a relationship. Becoming a parent is life-changing in so many ways that we never even imagined. But the costs of these relationships are worth the abundant and overflowing lives that they bring us. Living out our faith means embracing these changes and allowing them to mold us into the people God intends us to be. It's not just about adhering to a set of rules or external behaviors about how our relationships bless us. The relationships we have with each other, and especially our relationships with God, they are there to be blessings in our lives. Christian living isn't about law, it's about love. But one of the, the real dangers that Paul warns against is the tendency towards legalism, creating those additional sets of laws and rules that go beyond what God requires. And the Pharisees in Jesus' time, they were, they were masters at this, adding burdensome regulations that obscured the heart of God's law. But modern-day Christians can fall into the same trap, defining Christianity by a list of do's and don'ts rather than as a, as a living relationship with Jesus. So today we should ask ourselves, do we think of our Christian life as living by rigid rules and regulations? Or is it simply walking by faith and living in a relationship with Jesus? It's easy to fall into the comfort of following laws and end up in legalism. And it is comfortable. I mean, it's often easier to follow a list than it is to build a true relationship connection. But just as, uh, just as a parent-child relationship or a marriage cannot thrive merely by following a set of rules, neither can our faith. It requires trust, affection, the willingness to experience the vastness of God's love for us, which transcends any of those legal stipulations. The essence of the Christian life is not about observing laws or rituals. It's about embracing that personal relationship with Jesus and having an unyielding faith in him, in his teachings, in his sacrifice, and in his promise of eternal life. Our faith in Jesus, it should not make us slaves to a checklist, but rather it should free us to love like he loved. Instead of constraining us, it should open us up to, to possibilities, to, to love deeply and to extend grace abundantly, to be humble and compassionate, to spread joy and goodness wherever we go, to be bearers of God's light to a world where darkness is so prevalent. Paul assures us of an eternal dwelling in heaven. So let us hold fast to this hope that transcends all of our earthly challenges. Our mortal bodies may be fragile like tents, but our, spiritual, but our spirits are destined for an unshakable building made by God himself. Let this truth encourage us to walk by faith, not by sight, secure in the knowledge that our temporary struggles pave the way for an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Amen. I know that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now stand as the offerings are brought forward to the Lord.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you assure us of a heavenly home, eternal and secure. As we offer these gifts, help us to live by faith, not by sight, trusting in your eternal promises. May our offerings be a reflection of your longing for the, re for the eternal and our commitment to your work on earth, bringing hope and renewal to all. Amen. Let us now confess together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Most High, we give thanks to you that you have planted your holy word among us. Give healthy growth to your church, that we may weather the storm winds of this world steadfast in Christ, ever bearing the fruits of love and singing praises to your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, the great I am, what you have spoken, you will surely do. We implore you for the sake of Christ and your many precious promises to bless and defend our homes, to make the efforts of parents fruitful in the teaching of their children, and to preserve them in the saving faith of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we are bold to ask for all things because you have given us your spirit as a guarantee. Hear us as we intercede in Jesus' name for those in every need. Especially we lift up to you today, Mary Ellen, Jim, Sherry, Jerry, Jade, Robert, Larry, Marilyn, Tom, Becky, Jim, Ken, and Larry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, from whom all fatherhood is named, we give thanks for, your, for earthly fathers. Give them confidence in their station and zeal for their task to care for their families faithfully. Make them examples to their children of godly life and love of your word. Bless their work of bringing up children in the fear and instruction of the Lord, and give them the comfort of your absolution over all their shortcomings. Gather us together with all our fathers to your eternal household. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray as you have taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Declare.